Today, we celebrate the 17th Sunday of the Trinity season. Um, the Indian Lutheran theme for the Sunday is Christian freedom. Although our readings actually deal more with sham piety, ritualism, and legalism. Which I suppose we could use as a springboard to talk about Christian freedom of the gospel. The epistle lesson from Colossians, Paul, the Holy Spirit through Paul, warns us against burdening the hearts and consciences of other believers with various religious restrictions that have nothing really to do with our relationship with God and our freedom as children of God in that relationship. Um, you know, our piety is our piety. We don't need to force what we think on other people if it's not necessarily biblical. In our gospel today, he just reminds us the Sabbath for us, and again, not so much as a set of demands or rights that we fulfill to earn God's pleasure, but rather as a time to strengthen our relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. Truly one of the goals and results of Jesus taking up the cross is, is to restore us to the relationship with our God and Father who is to be lost in the and we fell into sin. In our reading, Jesus teaches our relationship to the law, to piety, and so forth. Piety is not If it serves our faith and our life in the Lord, worship is not a law that must be kept, but rather something meant to serve our needs, bolster our faith. If you don't believe me, read Article 7 of the Unburdened Confession. Worship and liturgy are to serve the people, strengthen their faith. People do not serve the liturgy as if it were a work. In previous years, I've often used this Sunday to actually preach through the liturgy, and I actually prepared two sermons for today.
Beloved of the Lord, let us draw near with true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord.
grace, mercy, and peace be to God our Father and our Lord and Savior. Remember, regarding me, no, I don't want to but remember the story. After God calls out Adam and Eve for their sin, their rebellion, both try to blame something other than themselves. Both try to somehow wiggle their way out of what they've done. Adam blames Eve and actually God forgave Eve. Eve blames the serpent and actually it's only the serpent who says nothing having accomplished his evil plan. You think about it, nothing has really changed. Our old Adam, our sinful nature is such that when we recognize we are sinful, when we see that on account of our sin we have earned God's wrath, and in a big sense owe him some kind of reparation which we cannot pay, we seek to find a way out of the predicament of our debt to him. We try in some way to wiggle out of the situation, point to other people who are worse than we are, Try to point to some kind of extenuating circumstances that, in our fallen, sinful reason and logic, should lessen our debt by pointing to extenuating circumstances that certainly should excuse our sin somehow. I'm not really to blame for stealing that food because I was hungry and I needed it. Somehow, we seek somehow to lessen the import and nature of our sin. Or, we then maybe try to find, find ways to appease God, or somehow make penance, pay him back through some sort of work or pious activity, to show that we really are on his side and not in hearts or truly rebellious. I think the second point is why we as sinful humans are so often drawn to rituals and fulfilling rituals, as if by fulfilling them we somehow appease God by doing something for Him, trying to make up for something not in us. We not only see this, especially in other religions, but the simple tendency also creeps into our Christian thinking and practices. Well, we see this tendency in the Old Testament lesson for today. The Lord through Moses, and the Lord through Amos, tells the people that their feast days, their holy assemblies, their sacrifices, all of which, by the way, he commanded that they do. All of the stuff that they're doing is not only useless, but offensive to God. He says, I hate them. I don't want them. Now he commanded them. How can this be so? They are offensive not because in and of themselves they are somehow offensive, but because the people of God are doing them in the wrong spirit. They are fulfilling them some sort of broke exercise, thinking that in so doing, that actually puts God on their side and in their debt. That somehow they have appeased God by doing the ritual putting a check mark, see, I've been to church today, see, I've had communion, see, hey, all right, great. They fulfill their external religious obligations apart from a true sincere faith and without the fruits that should grow out of a sincere faith in a sincere relationship with God, seeking His will, seeking His justice, submitting to His will. In our epistle lesson, the Holy Spirit through Paul, Colossians also talks about pious behavior and the danger of forcing our piety and our understandings onto others, judging others as less Christian by what we see as their lack of exercising proper external Christian piety. In our desire for pure and proper religion, we begin to create laws and demand practices of others that we feel are necessary, but in truth are not. 
even though to us they personally might be useful and beneficial. I see this in, in a lot of the discussions between traditional worship and contemporary worship. And you know, both sides kind of miss it, but it's like, oh, and I read one site where if it's not beeswax candles on the altar, that's heresy. Uh, where do you get that? What they think is necessary, they forget what is truly necessary. And we see this again in that religious piety and practice of the gospel that we read for today. Jesus is confronted twice concerning the seemingly impious, unreligious practice of his disciples. In the first conflict, it might be the disciples of God the Pharisees themselves, or at least the people who are seeing this, see a difference. They see that the Pharisees and disciples of John are fasting according to the rules. But the disciples are not. Jesus' disciples are not. His disciples are not fasting as they should be if they were following the standard Jewish practices. In the second time, the Pharisees attacked Jesus himself for allowing his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath, thus violating the Sabbath prohibition against work. His second question, of course, is a bit more serious, as it does, the second question is a little more serious, because it does imply very many commandments. Jesus, of course, defends his disciples' behavior in both cases, pointing out that the disciples had no reason to fast as his with them, comparing himself to the bridegroom, his disciples to his close friends. Part of the Bible. Why should they fast? Why would they fast? Fasting is a sign of mourning. Fasting is a sign of repentance. Fasting is a sign of humbling oneself before God. In that sense, a visible prayer to God for his attention and mercy. Jesus and disciples are already in God's presence. The disciples in his presence and the presence of the Messiah are certainly not going to mourn. They certainly have their attention.
And our gathering for this other holy community also gives us his very body of blood, his sacrifice for us. So first and foremost, as I said, God gives us his word. Not so that we read it in such a way as, well, I've read three chapters today, I have you know, three stars on my name and have a book. But rather, that through it we learn and we're reminded of his great love for us, revealed through his son. Through his incarnation, the life, his death for us on the cross, and his resurrection. We also learn from his word of his will, first of his desire to save us, and then how, after we are saved, we can answer to that love he has shown us, and how we are now we can begin to live as his children in humble and grateful obedience. God also gives us the Sabbath so that we can gather together as his children. We assemble together. And this assembly of believers, who he has called together through the word of baptism, is an assembly of his creation, of his children. Our coming together is not some sort of great sacrifice for God or work for him. Rather, our gathering here for worship is actually his gift. Here we gather as his children. Here we gather as brothers and sisters in Christ, made that way through him and our faith. We gather together for mutual support, care, and relationship with each other and with him. Our Father, our Creator, our God. In this Sabbath assembly, he also gives us the opportunity to pray for him, to praise him, and to strengthen our relationship with him so that we go home from here strengthened and that relationship continues every day. In this Sabbath assembly also gives us, like I said, the sacrament under his word. Our participation in the sacraments, again, is not a means for us to gain heaven, not a way to earn grace, but rather the means of the Lord for the Lord giving. In baptism, he works in us a new creation and gives us a new heart. In our baptism, he washes away everything, all of our sins, past, present, and future. All of our sins are completely washed away. We are reborn with the Spirit, water, and word, and made a new creation. And then in Holy Communion, he feeds our faith with his true body and blood as a means of strengthening our faith in the grace and forgiveness we have received. The same with absolution, when we confess and we hear absolution, it is to restore and confirm our faith in the forgiveness we've already received. He gives us his very body and blood, lest our faith falter and we doubt that his death on the cross was truly for us, lest we doubt that some sin we have recently committed negates our grace. Somehow we've lost it. It reminds us no. Still under my grace. Of course, all of these gifts are for us. The Sabbath, gathering, the worship, hearing his word, receiving the sacraments, and being in relationship with him and our brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're all a result of his most important gift to us. He's only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior. All stems from this. His gift is not so much the Sabbath, the day of worship and praise and relationship, but rather Jesus Christ himself. As much as Jesus reveals in our text about the Sabbath and proper understanding of piety, his most important teaching that Jesus reveals in this text is what he reveals about himself. He reveals himself as the bridegroom. He then reveals himself as the Son of Man. And finally, make clear that the Sabbath, as he's Lord of the Sabbath, is for us. He reveals his Lordship over the Sabbath. All of these reveal something about who Jesus is. As Lord of the Sabbath, he is clearly claiming divinity. For he himself was the one who established the Ten Commandments and gave them to Moses on Mount Sinai. 
As the Son of Man, he is claiming the prophetic, the Son of Messianic We read that he has come as our Savior, and as bridegroom, he is revealing his deep love and care for us. So as much as the Sabbath is for us, so much more is our Lord and Savior for us. He is our Lord and Savior who comes to the world, takes on our flesh for us, for you, each of you. You see, God not only provides us this Sabbath, the day of divine rest and provision of his word and sacraments, but through his Son, the greatest gift of all, he provides for us all that is needed. We always say free from sin, death, and the power of the devil is kind of a blueprint kind of thing. We are free. Christ is free from sin, death, and the power of the devil. What does that mean? Well, we're forgiven. Free from sin. The sin can no longer control us because it can be forgiven. If I sin, I go, no, I don't have to stay in the sin. I can reject it and I can move forward. Death, because in my sin, my death would be eternal. I would be eternally dead in hell as opposed to living in heaven. And that's the power of the devil. The power of the devil when we are free, we don't, he can't make us feel guilty about our sins anymore and hold us in that guilt. He can't use that guilt to control us, to drive us into despair. We see this happening, right? Judas would have repented and Jesus would have forgiven him, but he despairs and kills us. So thus we are free from sin, death, and the power of the devil. And what's more, through this, we are restored to a living relationship with our Heavenly Father. I've said this before, and probably I've reminded pretty much because we forget this. The important for us is that we have a reconciled
gathering in the name and in remembrance of him we beg you, O Lord, to forgive you and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take heed, this is my body which is for you. This do remember. In the same way also took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do is often drinking in remembrance of me. And we pray as the Lord taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
basis of sanctifying your feet to make your holy, whole, your whole spirit, soul, and body to serve blameless and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace and joy. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.
to Serbia to meet with uh, an American church in the and uh, it was supposed to be one week and on the second day they were like oh, we have an, one lady said I had an emergency back at home so I had to leave and we decided to meet with the whole delegation so it was probably an embassy hall or something so all the wrong people came to see and that's why okay <laughs> Okay, the hotel is prepaid. And we thought maybe that's because of the escalation. 